So uh, we're just with, it, with any more ado, let's uh, press the Pastor Jimmy to come and present what we believe God's given him today. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 We serve a mighty God. Amen. How many fathers are here this morning? How many dads? We wish you a happy Father's Day. We honor you, all the dads, all the spiritual dads. You know, some may not have physical kids, but you can have spiritual children. Uh, my wife and I, we're expecting our first in uh, December. So pray for us. Praise the Lord. I have heard that people don't sleep very well, but I rebuke that in Jesus' name. <laughs> Ours is going to sleep like a baby, and we're going to sleep like a baby. Praise God. Amen. It's so wonderful to be up here with you, and, uh, and it's just such an awesome presence of God. Um, just as we walked in, I, I said to the pastor, there's such a presence of God in this place. You know, sometimes we take it for granted because we get used to it. But, you know, whenever you come in from outside, and let me just say this, I travel to many nations and many churches, you have something special here. And, uh, and I thank God because of the leaders that you have, because they know how to host the presence of God. Can we appreciate Pastor Brian and his wonderful <laughs> wife? What a blessing you both are, and um, I just feel like I know you uh, for a long, long, long time. Praise God. There's a kindred uh, spirit here, and thank God for all those people behind the scenes, and the worship team did an awesome job. Can we appreciate them? Thank God for you guys. You make it easy to minister. You make it easy to minister. I didn't travel by myself. I came with my good mate, um, Ian. Um, Ian has been uh, with us. Uh, in our church up there in Toowoomba for a few years, uh, him and his wife Nadine came to our church, and um, and uh, Nadine uh, uh, passed away a few years back, and uh, Ian um, went through a bit of uh, heaviness, and and um, and the Lord said to me, "Take Ian with you," and so I said, "Ian, you know, um, we're gonna go together," and so I took him, and we started traveling together, and I saw the Lord just pouring life back into him, and and just restoring him, and um, you know, and God just growing him. So I thank God for him. He loves driving, um, and uh, so I said, "Well, that's a good area to serve." So he drove us out here. Praise God. Amen. So it's good to have a, uh, Ian with us. If you have your Bibles, um, I want us to look at a couple of scriptures that the Lord has put on my heart. And I'm believing God for um, a move of God um, in this nation. This is one of the reasons why God sent me to Australia. You know, a lot of people ask me, um, how did you end up coming to Australia? What were the circumstances of you coming here? And let me just say this. I am ha the harvest. I'm a harvest of the seeds that your forefathers sowed in Africa. Because you've got to understand, Africa was known as the dark continent, not because we you know, there was dark-skinned people there, but it was known as the dark continent because we ate the first missionaries that came. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Amen. We were savages. We invented witchcraft and all that stuff. But 100 years ago, there was nobody that believed in Jesus there. You know, they we believed in ancestors and ancestral worship and all kinds of stuff. And you know what? Your ancestors came and preached the gospel to the Africans. And and Dr. David Livingstone, if you read his story, you know, came all the way to the... Uh, Port of Mombasa preached all the way throughout Kenya. It wasn't known as Kenya in those days. Actually, we are a British colony. It was known as British East Africa. So that's Kenya, um, uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And he preached all the way to the Congo. And uh, he ended up dying from malaria or something. And the natives loved him so much. They carried him more than 500 kilometers on foot to get him to the port so that he can they can take his body back to the UK. Um, 
um, because they just so loved him and the gospel, the light that they brought. And let me just say this. We have seen revival. The fire of God has really begun to lit up in Africa and there's been moves of God over the years. Uh, in the 50s, God started moving powerfully. We had people like, uh, you know, um, um, Oral Roberts coming through and T.L. Osborne, who's done such a lot of work coming through uh, in Africa and miracles, signs and wonders breaking out there. John G. Lake, he was there in South Africa. And, um, you know, William Branham and some of those guys were in the South southern part of Africa and we've had men and women of God going through uh, and God started to set that continent on fire. There was actually in the 70s uh, a revival, they called it the Shining Ones Revival whereby a bunch of Africans decided they're going to go and lock themselves up in a church and refuse to leave until God shows up. And people will bring food and leave them at the door and they just prayed and prayed and prayed and what what you read in the Bible, where the Bible tells us that Moses went up into the mountain and into the glory of God, and he began to shine. And uh, when he came down, remember in the scriptures, the Bible says he came down and his face was shining. The people couldn't look at him. He had to wear a veil so that they could just focus on what he was trying to say. That's exactly what began to happen. And actually, Sid Roth has, uh, has, to has had an episode where he talked about this. He had a guy that did research and wrote a book about it, and he was interviewed about that particular move of God. If you want to hear more about it, you can go and just look for his videos. And, um, and, and so what happened is that these guys were transfigured in the natural. I'm not talking about they were shining in the spirit. Literally, there was something about their skin that was glowing in the natural. You could look at them and there was something coming off of them. And they never realized this because when they felt they had gotten a breakthrough and they came out of that building where they were locked themselves up in, the light of Jesus the glory, the, the, the glory of God was on them so strong. People in the villages started running, coming to look at them, and they started gathering what is happening here, what's going on. And uh, the na people started coming to know Jesus. Revival just began to break out uh, in the nation, and, uh, and, and, and a move of God began. They called it the, the Shining Ones Revival back in the day. And, and then uh, in the 70s, uh, God sent a man all the way from Germany. And uh, uh, and he'd been to Bible school uh, in England and uh, connected with, um, um, I think, it's one of the Jeffrey brothers, one of the evangelists, uh, prayed for him, laid hands on him. And he came to Africa and started doing crusades. God spoke to him and told him, Africa shall be saved. And he saw a dream of a blood-washed uh, uh, continent. And let me just say this. I, I have had the privilege of attending some of Reinhard Bonnke's crusades. I mean, to, to be able able to see more than a million people in one place. You know, I always share about revival, especially in the Australian churches, and I discovered that a lot of us here in Australia don't really understand what revival looks like. You know, we have no idea. Let me just give you a little bit of an idea. I remember getting up at five in the morning, going and praying and getting myself ready, going to the shower. Uh, and I used to pack a backpack where I would put a pillow in the backpack uh, because there was no chairs where you're going. You had to sit on my backpack uh, on the ground because the meetings, some of those meetings are so big, there's no room to put chairs or anything like that. So I'll put a pillow in my backpack and some water and, uh, and, I'll, put, and, and I'll leave home about six o'clock and um, hurrying to attend a meeting 20 minutes down the road that was starting at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I got on the bus and I got to the place and when I got to where the meeting was in this open field, because uh, in the 90s especially when we had revival breakout, some churches uh, were banned by the government from having indoor meetings. Not because the government was being nasty, but because there was no building big enough for the people. People were being trampled and on and all that sort of stuff. The crowds were just too big and they said, listen, if you want to have meetings, you got to do it outdoor because there's nothing we've got. The stadium was not big enough. The, the all biggest auditoriums were not big enough and so we had to have meetings outside and that's a good problem to have and so 
I remember getting to the meeting at 6 p.m., 6, uh, 6.30 there, 6.45 a.m. in the morning to attend a um, service that starts at 2 in the afternoon. And when I got there, there was already 200,000 people that beat me to it because I got up early so I can get a good position. I can get close to the stage. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? And by 2 p.m. in the afternoon, there was 1.2 million people in that place, worshiping the Lord, praising God. Before the meeting even began, there was already wheelchairs being lined up at the front. There was crutches being put up at the front. And uh, God had already begun to move. You see, whenever you begin to talk about revival, this is what revival begins to look like. You know, Bonke's largest meeting, he had 8 million people in attendance with 3,500,000 decision cards signed. That's almost the entire nation of New Zealand. Praise God. And um, Bonke would come to town. Our church, for example, you know, uh, he, he would come to town and a church of a few hundred would become a church of a few thousand in one week. Just over week, over an, an, a, week, a weekend, and uh, our pa- my pastor were back in Kenya didn't want to have a big uh, ministry, so he would, um, you know, he would split the, you know, he would tell this group go over there, start another church, and he split his church twelve times and started twelve branches to keep the congregation small, and he still had three thousand people in his church. That's a revival. Come on, somebody, Amen, Amen. Hallelujah. There's a church in Africa. I don't know if you've heard of, of RCCG Church. In uh, uh, Have you heard of the, the church that is three kilometers squared uh, building? Uh, three kilometers by three kilometers and they're increasing it because it's too small. You can go check it out on YouTube. RCCG, Redeemed Christian Something Gospel Church. 12 million people attend church there. Do you hear what I'm saying? 12 million. This church, when you stand on the stage, the back row is three kilometers away. That wall is 1.5 Ks that way. That wall is 1.5 Ks that way. You can go on YouTube. They actually do a church tour where they're driving a vehicle and there's a camera hanging out the window to show people how the big church is because they're driving around it. And they've had to build extension and another overflow because of the numbers of people. I, I when you make an altar call, they've got golf buggies that, that, that have a trailer for those who can't get to the altar so that they can come down. Somebody say revival. Amen. Amen. How many of you know God wants to do that in Australia? He wants to release something supernatural. So I'm just stretching your faith so you can catch something. Because sometimes when we speak revival, people don't really get and get the full idea of what that is. You can go check it out. Go do some Googling. You'll see that particular church. The largest church building that I've ever heard of, that I've ever seen. Most massive ministry. And they have, I mean, you forget about having kids church. I don't know how you have kids church and all the other stuff that we normally do. People kids who worship God in with the parents right next to them um, I mean it's it, but but God is doing something the the abundance of the sea is being converted unto us God is bringing people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light hallelujah and so for me, um, the Lord had spoken to me and uh, while I was in Kenya, and, uh, and I'm going to share some things briefly um, out of the scriptures here, just uh, so we can have a bit of a foundation. But I came here on assignment from God. Amen. I came here to encourage this church, to encourage you guys, to encourage this part of the country. And I encourage you to come along tonight if you can. But I believe that there's, there's a move of God that is coming to the great Southland of the whole Holy Spirit. There's revival that God is getting ready to bring. There's a move of God that God is getting ready to release. And let me just say this. I can feel the spirit of revival in this church. When I walked in here, you can feel the spirit of revival. You know, the the spirit of revival is different from what I call the full-blown manifestation of revival. The spirit of revival is what prepares the people of God for the full manifestation of revival. The spirit 
spirit of revival is almost like John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, was not the one, but he came to prepare the way for the one. And so he came to make way for the king, make way for the Lord, to bring down the, the, mount, the hills and bring up the valleys. John the Baptist's ministry was a ministry of preparation. He came to prepare the people. He baptized them. He got them ready because Jesus was about to show up. And I've noticed that before God sends a full-blown manifestation of revival where the fire of God begins to burn anywhere, he always sends the spirit of revival ahead, almost like a John the Baptist. The spirit of revival is what makes people feel like they're just not satisfied. Have you ever been in a place where you feel you spiritually like, I'm just not, there's got to be more. Something in you feels to press in to God and you, feel, you just begin to feel like, Lord, there's got to be more. What do I need to do? You, you begin to feel like fasting. You begin to feel like pressing into God. You come in early. You're lingering in the presence of God. There's a pushing in that you begin to do because you see, this is what is needed for the manifestation of revival to actually begin to break out. And I've been to places, the places you go, you don't, I don't sense it, but here I sense it. And this is because this church is going to become a springboard for revival in this region. When it begins to break out, come on somebody. When it begins to break out, God is going to do something powerful in this region from this place. And so it's time that we begin to find the flames of what God wants to do. It's time we find the flames of revival. We find the flames of the, of, of the spirit of God, the anointing of God, what God wants to release, what God wants to pour out. And, uh, and let me just say this. God has got a plan for this nation. Usually my first uh, time I preach anywhere, I try to share uh, this particular message because this is the reason why God sent me to this nation. You see, I, I was already traveling and preaching in Kenya. I was happy. I, I had a team with me. I was doing crusades. I was doing, uh, uh, we were going to conferences and we were seeing God moving in a powerful way. And I'll never forget this. I was invited to preach in Western Kenya and uh, me and my team, uh, we got in a vehicle and we decided we're going to go to Western Kenya to preach and um, uh, when we we got to Western Kenya. God uh, began to move there. We had a crusade for about five days. God was moving and we were seeing signs, wonders and miracles in that particular place. And uh, after that crusade, on my way back, the Lord began to speak to me. And he said to me, the place where you are, you know, you, your season here in Kenya is coming to an end. I'm about to send you somewhere else. And I had no idea where God was sending me because I had never left Kenya up to at, at that time. I'd been pretty Reaching around the nation, God was moving, but God spoke to me and He said, Your time here in Kenya is coming to an end. You know, sometimes God tells you that your season comes to an end, but He doesn't tell you where He wants to send you. That's what he did to Abraham. He said, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. God just expects us to be what? Obedient. To step out and obey him. So I never knew where God was sending me, where he was telling me I was going to go. But I knew that my time and my season was coming to an end in Kenya. And so I'm in this bus. We're traveling back to Nairobi. And I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, I feel like the season here has come to an end, but I don't know where you want me to go. Where are you sending me? And so I was at home, and I'm praying. I am calling upon the name of the Lord. At, at the t when when I got home, I'm and uh, and I had that. We I had this globe, this uh, this uh, map, this uh, you know, this inflatable globes, and I would spin it, and I'll pray, and I say, Lord, is it America? I'm praying, looking at this globe, spinning, and which way is it the UK? Where are you sending me? What where are you taking me, Lord Jesus? And I'm praying, I'm praying trying to get some direction because I could feel in my spirit there's a shift that had already begun. And so while I'm praying and I'm pressing into God, outside, uh, in, in, in Kenya, uh, just in Nairobi, outside Nairobi, there's a forest called Karura Forest. In this forest, there's huge, there's, a, there's huge caves and caverns whereby anybody, you can have up to two, three hundred people in this cave fasting and praying. People, that's our prayer mountain in Kenya. You know, like in, in, in Korea, they've got some, a place called 
called Prayer Mountain, where they all go to pray and to fast and to call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, we don't really have anything like that in Kenya. So people go to this forest where there's these huge caves, huge caverns. You can put three to five hundred people in any of those caves with very high ceilings. It sounds like, you know, a swarm of bees in there when you walk past it with people who are fasting and praying and calling upon the name of the Lord. And so there was a man there in this particular forest where people go to fast and pray. And let me tell you, the glory of God is very strong in that place. The power of God is very strong there. And so there was a man in there who was praying. He was calling upon the name of the Lord and he was praying for the elections. We were, the, the nation of Kenya was coming to election time. And you know, in Africa, we have a lot of trouble during election time. There's a lot of uh, rioting and looting and all sorts of stuff. And so this guy went to pray that the Lord will intervene and we will not have any rioting or problems during election. And so while he was praying, um, and he's a prophet, and, and to this day I've never really met him, but he was praying in this cave and, uh, and uh, at the end of his prayer time, um, he was caught up in a vision. Jesus took him up to heaven. And so he was doing, a, I think it was a 40 day fast and he had gone in there in the, for, in, to, in the forest to fast. And so he started, he was, while he was in heaven, he was walking with Jesus in this beautiful garden. And Jesus said to him, um, this, uh, he said to him, the next president of Kenya is going to be this individual. And uh, the next, uh, you know, this is what I want you to pray for this particular president. And uh, then the, the Lord said to him, you know, I want you for the next four years to pray over this issue as far as the nation is concerned. And, um, and so the Lord was speaking to him about these different issues. And then towards that that vision, the end of that vision, Jesus stood and looked at him in the face and said to him, tell my servant Jimmy that I am going to raise him up and I'm going to send him to the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just say this, Jesus, because I never knew what the great Southland of the Holy Spirit was until I came here. I never knew there was a country called that. This guy has never left Africa, didn't, never knew what that nation was. But Jesus referred to this nation as the great South land of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know Jesus knows Australia by his prophetic destiny? Yeah. Amen. Amen. He knows this nation by its prophetic destiny. He calls those things that be not as though they are, and let me just say this, until they become. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so Jesus said, said to him in the vision, he said, I'm raising him. Go tell my servant Jimmy, I'm raising him up and I'm going to send him to the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Because the people of that land have been praying and have been crying out to me for revival. They've been crying out to me for a move of the spirit. They feel like I have forgotten them and I have let them and, and, I've, and, and, I, and I have bypassed them. But tell them that I am saving the best for last and that I'm about to turn the waters into wine hallelujah glory be to God come on let's give God praise for that word amen thank you and so Jesus says this is a prophetic word that is being released tell him that I am going to open doors for him that I will go before him and I will open doors and I will move and release the anointing, the grace of God, the power of God. And that God is going to release his power over this land. And let me just say this. God was speaking to him in the vision. Jesus, get this, gave him my phone number. He gave him my phone number. He comes out of the cave after he comes out of this vision. Comes out of the cave. Picks up the phone. And he calls the number he got in the vision. I'm at home. I'm praying, Lord, where are you sending me? Where are you sending me? I've got the globe. I'm spinning it. Lord, where are you sending me? The phone begins to ring. I pick up the phone and I say, hello. And this guy says, I'm prophet Samuel. I'm a man of God and I have a prophetic word for, for you. I thought it was one of the kids from church playing a prank on me. So I was not ready to receive it. I was giving him a hard time. You know, who are you really? Is this some scam or something? What do you want? You know, I'm just giving the guy a hard time. So he ignored me and he just started to prophesy because he realized I was not ready to receive what he had to say. He began to prophesy from the past. He said, five years ago, this and this and this happened in your life. He told me stuff about my names, places, dates. Nobody would have known. He said, four years ago, this and this and this happened in your life. He told me stuff 
stuff about my family, my parents. Nobody would have known. And I'm sitting there thinking, yes, that's correct. Three, he said three years ago, this and this and this happened in your life. I was like, yeah, that's correct. That's right. Two years ago, this and this and this happened. I said, yes, that's right. One year ago, he's prophesying five years of my life. Telling me stuff like on this year, your brother went and did, you know, went a driving test and he passed on this. I mean, giving the dates. I didn't even know the dates. I mean, he was precise. He said last year, this and this and this happened in your life and in your family's life. I said, that's right. And then he says, I can actually see you in a vision right now. He said, you're not very tall. Praise God. He said, you're in this room. There's some couch there and they started describing the couch and, they, and he said, there's a photo on the wall and he said, you're standing there holding this phone you're wearing shorts and a red t-shirt and he told me what was written on my t-shirt i said speak loud for your servant is listening amen he said before this year finishes god's gonna put you on the plane you're gonna be in the going to the great southland of the holy spirit we had to work out what where that is we, you're gonna go to that place and he said god is gonna send you there to prepare the people for what god is getting ready to do because of Australia is going to become a springboard for revival to the nation. You see, Australia, when I came here, I realized what the prophet said to me was true. Because Australia has been crying out to God, just like blind body Myers on the side of the road. You see, blind body Myers had no problem with hearing. His problem was with seeing. You see, he had no issues with hearing. Hearing was good. But he was broken down on the side of the road. He was stuck on the side of the road. Everybody was just passing him by and australia has been like that it feels like people are just just passing us by now the nations are having revival you got the azusa street you know azusa revival you've got the hebrides revival in the uk you've got all this stuff happening in the nations the pensacola outpouring of the spirit you've got the 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 uh, the bay of the holy spirit revival you've got you've got all these moves of god that are breaking out in other nations you know, we are watching africa and thousands Thousands of people coming to know the Lord. And the people of this nation have been crying out and saying, God, when will you do it for us? When will you do it for us? But you've got to understand, God was speaking to me and he said, I'm about to move the people of this land from just hearing to seeing. Hallelujah. Because we have heard that God wants to bless us, but we haven't seen it. We've heard that God wants to give us revival, but we haven't seen it. We've heard that God wants to fill us up, but we haven't seen it. We've heard that God wants to raise the dead and perform unusual miracles, signs, and wonders, but we haven't come to the place of seeing it. And the Lord said to me, tell my people, if they are tired of being broke down, busted on the side of the road, and they are willing to see transformation, I'm about to do it for them. I'm about to move them from hearing to seeing. There's nothing frustrating than being able to see what God has in store for you and not being able to step into it. Do you know Moses? The Bible says Moses went up the mountain and God said, I'm going to allow you to see it, but I'm not going to let you step in into it. You've seen it is possible to see what God wants to do and not be able to step into it. How many of you know God wants to bring us from just hearing to seeing? And the only way we can get there is if we refuse to allow the enemy to shut our mouths. You've got to open your mouth and you've got to learn to navigate the negatives until you get to the positive. The Lord said to me, and I'm going to give you some principles of revival. You see, blind Barry Myers opened his mouth and he began to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You've got to understand, he realized that if God does not not if you, you, you gotta make an appointment with God you've got to cry out to God he said I'm not gonna let another day go by with me in the same old same old same old something has got to change until people come to a place where there are no law they, they are just tired and they're saying something has got to shift nothing moves until you move yes. hallelujah I said, nothing moves until you move. You've got to get to a place where you say, why sit here and die? If we go into the city, they're in trouble. But let us march towards the, 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 the army of the enemy. And let me tell you, the moment you begin to march, God is waiting to march with you. There are hosts of heaven. There is angelic hosts that are just waiting for somebody to put one foot in front. 
You see, those men with leprosy that were outside the city in the gates of Samaria, they said, why sit we here and die? You see, they couldn't go into the city because they had leprosy and they couldn't go out because they were surrounded. They said, why sit we here and die until we come to a place where we are tired of the same old, same old and say, God, something has got to shift. Nothing will shift. They said, why sit we here? They began to march. And the moment they began to march, the armies of God began to march. When you move, he moves. When you walk, he walks. When they took one step, a thousand angelic hosts of God took one step. And you know what? The enemy had the angels marching. They thought they had an army that was showing up. And they took off and they ran away. And let me tell you, when he got there, it was revival. Because everything that they had been believing God for was there. How many of you know the battle belongs to God the victory belongs to us you see blind body Myers he didn't hold back he opened his mouth and he began to shout he said Jesus son of David have mercy on me now let me just say this the moment he shouted Jesus heard him the moment he opened his mouth and he shouted Jesus heard him but Jesus never responded because sometimes you've got to understand that that you may have to navigate a lot of negatives before you get to the positive sometimes you have to navigate some challenges before you get to your breakthrough sometimes God keeps quiet on purpose because he wants to know how bad do you want your breakthrough How bad do you want your miracle? How bad do you want to see revival? How bad do you want to see that move of God? How bad do you want to see miracles, signs, and wonders? How bad do you want to see blind eyes open, deaf ears open, cripples walking? How bad do you want to see a breakthrough that God wants to release? Sometimes before you catch God's response, you may have to deal with the the hit back and the, the cutbacks of the enemy. Now, the Bible says that the people came to, to, to blind body Myers. They said, shut up, bl- blind body Myers. Keep your mouth shut. You don't need to do all that. Why are you doing all that? They told him to shut up. you got to understand, sometimes before you get God's attention, you may end up getting the attention of the enemy. And that's why sometimes people give up because when they begin to pray, things begin to go wrong. They begin to pray, their body begins to suffer. They begin to pray, stuff begins to go haywire in their lives. Because sometimes you have to navigate the negatives before you get to your breakthrough. Come on somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes before you can get to your miracle, you may have to deal with some negatives. You've got to get to a place where when they tell you to turn it down, you turn it up. Come on, somebody. I said turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. That means your prayer life needs to be turned up. That means your worship needs to be turned up. When you come in and you don't feel like worshiping, because when you choose to press in, things started to go all kind of crazy in your life. That's when you need to come and hang on the horns of the altar and say, God, I'm not moving. The devil's trying to shut me up, but I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to give God a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm preaching this morning. Amen. I came to tell somebody, don't let anybody steal your joy. Don't let anybody steal your praise. Don't let anybody shut you up. A closed mouth is a closed destiny. If the devil can shut you up, he can keep your destiny. He can keep your goods. He can keep your miracle. It's important that we open our mouths and give God a praise in this place. Amen. Hallelujah. I came to say to somebody, it's time to open our mouths and give God a shout of praise. When they say, turn it down, turn it up. Don't just pray one hour. If you feel opposition, add another hour. Tell the devil, I dare you mess me up. I dare you to touch my kids. Touch my, I'm going to give even more. Come on, turn it up. Somebody say, turn it up. Just when you want to be generous, that's when your car breaks down. Come on, somebody. That's when stuff starts to go. Come on, you better tell the devil, you're not going to turn me down. I'm going to turn it up. Because when you do that, that's when they, you know, they say, shut down, shut up. Just turn it down. It doesn't take all of that. Why you got to do this? Why you got to? But you got to understand at that time, Jesus said, bring him to me. Bring him to me. He was tired of hearing about what God wants to do for him. He wanted to begin to see it. He 
wanted to enter into the place of seeing. You know, sometimes before God can cause you to see stuff in your life, he will cause you first to hear it. Do you remember Elijah? The Bible says there was famine in the land for three and a half years. There was, there was no rain. People were dying all over the place. And then the Bible says after they had had that contest in Mount Carmel, uh, the Lord, the Bible tells us that the Lord had spoken to, to, to Elijah. And this is what Elijah said. He said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Before you can see it, sometimes you've got to hear it first. Let me just say this. This is how God releases things in this dimension. He first opens your ears to see. Before you can see, to, to hear. Before you can see, you will always find yourself hearing. He said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. But just being able to hear it doesn't mean we sit back and just wait for it to happen. You've got to do something. So the Bible says he began to climb the mountain. He went up the mountain and when he got to the top of the mountain, he got in a bathing position and he began to pray. The first time he prayed, he said to his servant, go and have a look. He went and had a look because you got to understand that he said, I can see it, but I'm not hearing. I'm not see I can hear it, but I'm not seeing it. He said, I can hear it. I hear God wants to heal. He wants to deliver. I can hear it. I can hear it in my spirit. But I want to see it actually in front of me. I want to go see God manifested. He said to his servant, go and check. And the Bible says his servant went and had a look. And he said, I see nothing. He came back and said, I see nothing. Let me just say to you, blind body Myers, before you can see your breakthrough, you may have to navigate the negatives before you get to the positive. Sometimes you got to keep on pressing in. You can't give up the first time you don't give up the second time keep pressing in the bible says he kept praying he said go and have a look he went and had a look and then he came back he said i see nothing you've got to learn how to push yeah. hallelujah p-u-s-h pray until something happens that means if you're pregnant with something, you're carrying something on the inside, you have a vision, you've got a desire. God has told you, I'm going to do this for you. Before you can see it out here, he always deposits it in on the inside. You will carry it as a vision. That means you're hearing it. I can hear the sound of abundance of rain. But how do you get what is on the inside, on the outside? Somebody say, push. Pray until something happens. Most of us, we give up too quickly. We give up too soon. We pray, then we check ourselves. The pain is still there. I give up. No, you keep coming down to the altar. Even if you came last Sunday and nothing happened, you come back again. There is something about persistence that moves the hand of God. Glory be to God. This is a principle of revival. If you want to see God break through in this place, in this nation, we have to come to a place where we don't give up, we don't give in, we don't throw in the towel. We need to come to that place where we say, God, we shall not give in. We shall press in until we see breakthrough. He got in the birthing position and he was pushing. He said, go and check again. He went and had a look. He said, I see nothing. Let me just say this. When you pray for your kids and you see no change, don't give up. When you pray for your wife to get healed and delivered and you see no change, don't give up. When you pray for your finance and it's not changing, you're getting letters of demand and you're getting threats and nothing is turning around. Don't give up. Keep pushing. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pressing in. If you believe in God for breakthrough and you're not seeing the breakthrough, don't just give up. Keep pressing in because there's a breakthrough on the other side. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Just keep pressing in. Just keep pressing in. Keep pressing in. If you lay hands on the sick and they're not getting healed, keep laying hands on them. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't just give up. Keep laying hands on them. What if they drop down and they die? Jump over them and go and pray for the next one. Keep pressing in. There's something about tenacity that God moves, that moves heaven. Come on, somebody. You see, back in high school, I used to do physics. And in physics, our physics teacher used to say, you know, every time he would give us a very complex uh, calculation and we, we would give up because it was too hard. He used to say, don't suffer from give abitis. Give abitis is that disease of giving up every time something becomes hard. Don't look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. We are not the type to give up. We're not the type to go back, to, with, to, to, to shriek back. We are the ones that press in. Come on, somebody. 
We don't retreat and hide. We are called to arise and shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Even though darkness is covering the earth and gross darkness the people, the light of Jesus shall rise upon you. God is calling us to arise at this time. I say don't give up. Don't give in. Press in. Press in. Press in. Don't allow discouragement to hinder you. Don't allow discouragement to stop you. Don't allow discouragement to cause you to stop pressing in to God. It doesn't matter if you've been waiting a long time. Let me just say this. God can turn things around in 24 hours. It doesn't take long with God. He can turn things around in 12 hours. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you keep on hanging on and you stay in the place of faith and in the place of believing, God can turn it around. There's a man by the name of Joseph. He went to sleep. The Bible tells us he got up in the morning in the prison, but that night he went to sleep in the palace. He, there was no election. There was no board to decide whether they should let him in. There was no, I mean, are you hearing what I'm say God can do it within 12 hours God can do it but he's looking for people who position themselves in a place of expectation and refuse to give up I felt in my spirit as I was coming here coming out here that the Lord wants to heal us and to set us free from disappointment There's disappointments that God wants to clean us off. He wants to deliver us and set us free from the disappointments of life. There is a grace that God is releasing. And there is an anointing that is pouring out. I feel in my spirit that God is releasing us. And let me just say this. We're going to read some passages here that's going to bless somebody. If you have your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 5. This is going to help somebody. And then we're going to pray. We're going to believe God for an outpouring of the spirit. We're going to move in signs and wonders because I feel like there's an anointing that God wants to pour out. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Luke chapter 5. The Bible says, so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gensaret. Verse 2, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. The fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Now, one thing we've got to understand, the reason why they were washing their nets was because it was an all-night struggle. All night they had been fishing. And what they were doing is they were casting the net into the water and pulling nothing out. They cast the net into the water and pulling nothing out. It was an all-night struggle. They were casting the net into the water and really what they were pulling out, the reason why they were having to clean the nets is because they were pulling out empty Coke bottles. They were pulling out, you know, shopping plastic. You know, stuff you pick up at the bottom of the lake. They were pulling out rocks. They were pulling out some sticks. And they were pulling out all kinds of trash that people had thrown into the lake. But they were not pulling out fish. Because the nets represents your expectation. It represents what you expected. You, you throw, cast your expectation. The Bible says the expectation of the righteous will not what? Be cut off. Faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. And I like this particular translation which says faith gives substance to things hoped for and it is the evidence of things not seen. Faith gives substance to things hopeful. But sometimes you can be in faithful stuff and not see them. And you know what? The Bible says hope, uh, hope deferred makes the heart to grow sick. So it is possible to release your faith for things for a long time. And when you don't see those things you're hoping for coming to pass, hope deferred can make your heart grow sick. And there are many people in the kingdom of God whose heart has grown sick because they have been tired of being in that same place of waiting like that man by the pool of Bethesda who had been there for 38 years. 
and it always feels like somebody else is getting the breakthrough. Lord, I'm praying to get married and tomorrow somebody else is getting married. It always feels like somebody else is the one jumping in. Lord, I pray that I get debt free and somebody else is giving a testimony that they've just paid off their house and you're like, God, what about me? Have you ever been in a situation where it feels like you're just people just passing you over? Hope deferred can make the heart grow sick. This is what was happening here. They were throwing their nets in hope to catch fish. But what they were bringing up was coke bottles and, and weeds and, and all sorts of stuff. And that is why they went to wash their nets in the morning. Because they had picked up a lot of stuff that they didn't want to pick up. They picked up all kinds of trash. And let me just say this. God wants us this morning to wash the nets of our expectation. Amen. He wants us to clean our nets. Some of us, we've been so disappointed by life, so disappointed by ministry, so disappointed by people around us. God wants us to wash our nets and not only wash our nets, but to make room for him in our boats. You see, your boat, the boats represents your ministry. It represents your assignment. It represents that which God has given you. It gives, represents your church. It represents that, that evangelistic uh, ministry that God has given you. Everybody has got a boat. And it is important that we make room for Jesus in our boat. There's two things that the Lord is asking us to do this morning. Number one, wash your nets and make room for him. Because there's healing that is coming. Amen. Because sometimes when we do things in our own ability, in our own power, in our own strength, we come into a place of disappointment. Every time we are out there working, doing stuff in our own strength, we always find ourselves in a place of disappointment. And the Lord said to me, there's going to be an anointing this morning whereby he's going to heal some people. Because people have gone away from their boats to wash their nets. They don't preach like they used to. They don't sing like they used to. They don't pray like they used to because they have gone and disappointed. The things they prayed for didn't come to pass. The things they were expecting didn't happen. And now they have walked away from their boats. And the Lord is saying, I want you to heal or to clean your nets. Get to a place where you get rid and shed your disappointment. There's healing right now in this place. God wants to heal the brokenhearted. How many of you have ever been in that place where you don't even feel like praying anymore? Because you have prayed and you have not seen anything. People suffer from what I call revival fatigue. Where they've been believing God for revival until when they hear the word revival, they just go, oh, they roll their eyes. I don't want to hear about it. We've been talking about this for years and years and years and we have seen nothing. Let me just say this. It's time to wash our nets. Clean your hearts from the disappointment. And as you do that, make room for him in your boat. Make room for him in your boat. In other words, those who have not been praying like they used to, it's time to get back and allow Jesus to come into your prayer ministry. Allow Jesus into your, into your, into your evangelistic work. Allow Jesus into your business. Allow Jesus into whatever he has given you to, to, to bring in the harvest and let Jesus use your ministry and your house and your life and your church and whatever God has given you. Let God use it as a platform. To reach out to the nations. The Bible says Jesus came in into that boat. They were out. They had left their boat. They were cleaning their nets. And he stood there. And he began to preach to the multitudes that had gathered. He began to preach to them. And let me just say this. There's two kinds of fish. There's the fish that walk on land. And there's the fish that lives in the water. Sometimes if you want to be able to get the fish in the water. You must put the fish on land first. Come on somebody. Seeking what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. One of the guys in our church that runs a restaurant said, Pastor, what can I do? My business is not doing well. I said, open your, busy, your restaurant for, for a church lunch next Sunday. And, and, and don't charge anyone anything. Cook a scrumptious meal. You feed the people in the church. I'll, I'll get the people to come. We will come and we will be freeloaders. We'll come and eat for free. Praise God. I said, we're going to show up. He said, but, but, but you don't understand, Pastor. My restaurant is not doing very well. I said, I'm giving you the solution. I said, if your restaurant can become a platform for feeding these people then God will make sure that when you open on Monday there's going to be fish coming jumping everywhere lining up asking putting on come on somebody if you feed this fish God will make you a fisher of men 
And let me just say this, use your, let your platform, let your business be a platform to be able to help people and to be able to be a blessing. And so the Bible says he turned around, he turned around. And this is something that's going to bless somebody. He looked back and he saw all these people that had come together and they were willing to receive from Jesus. They were fed. And the Bible says Peter, after these people were ministered to, Peter jumped into the boat with Jesus. And Jesus said to him, launch into the deep. And I'm going to start to finish in a minute. He said, launch into the deep. That means that after you have washed your disappointment and after you have come to a place whereby you have, you, 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 you've made room for Jesus, now begin to go deeper in the things of God. Yeah. You cannot catch a whale on the beach. You want to catch big fish, you got to go deeper. Some of us, we are praying for blind eyes to be open. We are praying for big miracles. There are no big miracles on the show. You got to go deeper if you want to see the big fish. The Bible says deep calls unto deep. Deep calls unto. Now listen to this. This is the revelation God gave me. You see in God, you picture God like the ocean. You see there are different kinds of miracles. How many of you know not all, all miracles are the same? Praying for somebody's neck to be healed and raising the dead are two different things. Praying for knees to be healed and praying for somebody who has no leg for an amputee, for a leg to grow up. Those are two different things. How many of you know there's differences? Amen. It takes greater faith for certain miracles. And so in God, there are certain miracles which are called weighty miracles. These weighty miracles are just, they are at the bottom. Let me just say, think of God like an ocean. They are at the bottom. The lighter miracles, you know, praying for a sore knee and a sore back and a sore neck. The lighter miracles are on the top. You see, sometimes deep calls unto deep. You've got to understand, if I have a deep relationship with God, I can access the deep things of God. That's what that verse means. Come on, somebody. You see, a lot of the times, people are shallow in their walk with God. Shallow in reading the Bible. Shallow in their prayer. But they're expecting the deep things of God. Shallow doesn't call unto the deep. If you are shallow, you can only access what? Shallow things. And so, if you want to be able to access the deep things of God, you've got to come from a deep place within your own walk with God. That's why he said go deeper, 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 deeper. You've got to go deeper. Don't be satisfied with water on your ankle. Go to the, get to your knees. Keep going till it's on your, on, your, on your waist. Keep going till you're swimming in it. Go deeper, deeper, deeper. Don't just allow one little part of your life, but allow your whole life to be immersed in the glory and in the power and in the presence of God. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, go deeper. It's time to go deeper. Let your prayer life go deeper. Let, make sure if you are just spending five minutes a day, make it half an hour. If you are spending only a shorter time, make sure that you increase it. It's time for us to go deeper. He said to the disciples, go deeper, launch into the deep. And when you go into the deep, let me just say this, the expectation of the righteous will not be cut off. If you cleanse your nets and you wipe, you clean your nets and you make room for him and you go deeper in the things of God. If you do these three things, the expectation of the righteous will not be cut off. The Bible says they began to argue with Jesus. They said, Lord, we've been casting net all night but, but, and caught nothing. But nevertheless, at your word, we shall obey. They threw the net in and the Bible says they could not bring in the harvest. There was so much fish that jumped into the net. They were fighting to jump into that net. They were fighting to get into, the, into, the, into his net. God was bringing, there was breakthroughs and miracles that were being released at that point in time. And the Lord said to me, go and tell the church this morning that if they will clean their nets of disappointment and not give up and not give in and not be, get to a place where they have, they have become despondent and if they make room for me and begin to go in the, the deep things of God, then whatever they are expecting, whatever they are believing God for, in conjunction with me, I will give them their breakthrough. 
Let me just say this. This church can be filled up 10 times over when you get this revelation. There is, there is people that are going to come from everywhere. They're going to say, where is God moving? God is moving in this place, Lighthouse. Let's go there. God is moving in our place. Let me just say this. There is a revival that God wants to release. But if the church can understand these three points, there's going to be an outpouring and there's going to be souls coming into the kingdom of God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And let me just prophesy to this church because you're going to get to a place whereby, Pastor, you're going to have a good problem. I believe you're going to call your other ch- friends around. Hey, we got too many people. I don't know what to do with these people. Can you take some? That's what happened with the disciples. They had so much that their boat was sinking. We don't know. We can't sleep. They're working us around the corner, the clock. They're ringing all the time. I'm going to give some people to some other place. Can you g- come on some? How many of you know this is what revival looks like? like when you are offering people to go to another church that is revival and they will tell you no pastor we don't want them because we already got too many over here come on somebody how many of you know this is revival the bible says the same people that they were that there were other fishermen they said they called them they said come we can't do this by ourselves let us connect let us build strategic relationships so that we can network and work the net come on somebody if you want to work the net, you got to learn to network. Get connected and bring this fish because there's a time coming where God is going to release souls into the kingdom and one person, one nation, one church, one denomination is not going to be able to handle it. We are coming into a time where we're going to begin to call out and ask people to come and help us because we got too many people. We don't know what to do. Worship team, you're going to have so many guitar players and drummers. You're going to be calling others. We got two. We don't know what to do with them. Do you need musicians? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. How many of you know God can do it? I said God can do it. God can do it. I said God can do it. There is a breakthrough that God is sending. There is an increase that God is releasing. There is a power that God wants to pour out. Hallelujah. God can do it. He can do it for each and every one of us. And it doesn't matter where you are believing God for. There is abundance. There is overflow that is coming. Because God is not enough. He is more than enough. He is El Shaddai. God who is more than enough. He doesn't just multiply for the 5,000 to eat. He makes sure there is overflow. There is 12 baskets left over. He he always does over and above. You ask him for 10, he gives you 20. Come on somebody. How many of you know we serve the God of the overflow? He will always give you more than you even can bear. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has he not in the heart of man what God has in store for those who love him. There is stuff that God has in store for you. If we can have somebody up on the keyboard. Glory be to God. Somebody said, do it with me, Jesus. I want this. I want this. We want to see revival. We want to see a move of God. Can we pray for Bobo? I believe that this church is not only going to be a, 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 a lighthouse. And I thank God for that prophetic sign there. You're not going to just, you're going to be a lighthouse to this region. To Tinana and all through, all around. People are going to come to this place like the pool of Bethesda. Because I saw in my dream last night, the angel coming to stir the waters. And as people show up in this place, there's going to be healing and miracles that God's going to begin to release. This is going to be a house of solutions. Come on somebody. People with problems, do you have an issue? Go to that church. If you got this problem, just go to that church. Why? But just go to that church. They will show up and they will find I am that I am. Because he will be a healer to those who need healing. A teacher to those who need teaching. He will be a deliverer to those who need deliverance. He will be a lawyer to those who need a lawyer. He is everything to everybody. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We are making room for Jesus in this place. God is about to show up and people will come in with all kinds of needs in their lives and they will not live the same way. God is going to meet them in this place. I prophesy it. I call it into being in the name of Jesus. Let it be so and it cannot be otherwise. 
I decree and declare let the angels come down to this place may they begin to stir up the waters may begin to stir up the hearts of men and women in this place may the angels come and begin to stir up the waters may this house become a house of solution and house of answers where people will come and meet up with Jesus oh God we press into you we will not give up we will not give in we will not pr we press into you Lord we press into you Jesus we press into you we want revival we want to see a move of God come on for, for, for two minutes come on let's begin to pray right now like blind body Myers I want you to say God I'm not satisfied we want to have there's gonna be more pressing 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 this morning to God pressing to God pressing to God somebody's salvation depends on your prayer this morning somebody's deliverance depends on your prayer this morning somebody who is going to be lost depends on your intercession this morning God we cry out to you like blind body Myers Jesus son of David have mercy on us 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 Jesus Son of David, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy on us. Oh, we cry out, we cry out, we cry out to you, Lord. We cry out to you, Jesus. Take it up, 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 up. 